Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, how's the volume? Can everyone hear? Good. Awesome. Uh, well, first of all, thank you all for coming this afternoon, especially on a very snowy afternoon. I was supposed to be actually speaking at a, at a meeting uh, this morning in Calgary and uh, decided last night to Skype in to speak at the meeting rather than being uh, stranded in Calgary. I actually said to the organizer of the co conference, it's probably career limiting to miss the budget uh, meeting where the president's supposed to speak to everyone. So I'm glad I was here to be uh, able to be here today. So today we're obviously here to talk about uh, the budget. Um, we will start off by talking about budget 2019 and 2020, and then we will move into talking as much about uh, the looking forward information about budget as we can, recognizing, and, uh, and I'll come back to this, that we only have so much information. One of the things that we've tried to do as this process has unfolded is to provide you as much information as we can on an ongoing basis. And so each time we've received a fairly significant new chunk of information, we've uh, provided that out to you under my signature. We will continue to do that as uh, this budget process unfolds and we'll use as many different strategies for communication as we can. I did want to underscore and uh, right at the start that I know that this uh, period of time is, is an unsettling period of time for everyone. I know it's an unsettling period of time for people on campus, uh, but I also know it's an unsettling period of time for uh, folks in Lethbridge and around Alberta because this is an Alberta-wide challenge. And so I wanted to acknowledge that and to say that for any of you that are struggling at any point in time, we do have supports and services that uh, we have available on campus. And I really do want to emphasize that it's important uh, if you are struggling to reach out and ensure that somebody uh, has an opportunity to help support you. With that, um, I will move into talking a little more about the budget. And I did want to underscore that what we're providing you today is really as much as we know. Hopefully you won't be dissatisfied with the amount of information that we provide uh, because we can only provide you with the information that we know. We don't want to speculate, and I, I'll underscore that. I'm not going to muse about what might happen within the next two or three years from a specifics perspective. I will give you a sense of some of the things we have a sense will unfold over the next few years. Now, I'm supposed to actually man this myself, I just remembered. So, there we go. So, I'll start off with just uh, um, reminding us of where we're at for budget 2019. And so, we of course had a sense that this was going to be a very difficult budget. And so, I'll, I'll just underscore that we have been working towards uh, this budget uh, for many months. And I'd like to acknowledge all the work of all of the folks uh, that have been leading this budget conversation, the budget committee, uh, financial services, Nancy, Andy, many, many individuals carry. Uh, and this uh, has been hard work, but it is work that has, uh, I think, been done very well. So th the information that we finally did receive uh, is that um, the reduction for this year, 2019-2020, is a 3.2% reduction to our Campus Alberta grant, which represents uh, $3.4 million. Just to give you a sense of, of the impact that has on our overall budget, uh, the Campus Alberta grant is about 65% of our, our overall budget as a university. The second thing that happened was that there was an elimination of the infrastructure maintenance program for 4.2 million. So on an annual basis, we receive funds to support all of the upkeep uh, and renovations to our buildings on campus. And so for this year, we'll have no funds uh, to support those kinds of activities. Um, I'll just emphasize that um, these reductions uh, that we received just, as you know, in the very recent time are in year. And this is the first time I've seen in year reductions like this, I'll just uh, say. Uh, we did not necessarily expect in year reductions, but they occurred. We were prepared for it, but uh, uh, reducing the budget to this magnitude in year when we're um, in the latter part of our fiscal year is not an easy challenge. The last thing I'll say is that the information that we also received um, uh, when we received our budget is that looking forward, uh, that there the government has um, will be taking the freeze off uh, tuition that we've had over the last four years, and um, there will be uh, 
that universities will be and colleges and others will be able to increase tuition by up to 20%. Now, seven years ago, um, when there was a different government in power, uh, we had um, a uh, very unsettling announcement by the then Minister of Advanced Education that uh, they were going to reduce our budgets by about 7.3%. Um, that was uh, a period of time like this where um, the university and our community uh, you know, really had to sort of respond to a challenging situation. Um, since uh, the actual introduction of that number, the number was uh, subsequently reduced, I think 4.3, 4.9, okay. I wanted to make it sound better than it was, 4.9%. And so when we were faced with that uh, challenging uh, uh, process of looking at how to reduce our budget by just about 5%, uh, we undertook a, a, a process uh, led by Andy, but, but with all of us participating, uh, to look at what would be the best way to move through the um, budget reduction exercise influenced by core values that we felt were important to uh, attend to. After a very, very good discussion across campus, we ultimately came up with three core values that should um, underscore, uh, or sorry, underlie uh, the decision-making process that we would undertake to uh, reduce our budget at that point in time. The, the three values are people, quality, and access. And I can assure you as we've, um, at that time, as we moved through all the bud bu budget deliberations, we were very careful to consider those three values. So as we look forward, uh, both in this in-year cut as well as looking forward beyond, we have reaffirmed that these three core values for budget deliberation will be maintained, and we've certainly uh, reminded ourselves of these values as we've moved through the difficult decision making. So let me just talk briefly about the impact operations uh, for 2019-2020. I'll start off by saying that um, we have now balanced the budget for 2019-2020, meaning that we have achieved the reduction that we were uh, that we need to for this year, the $3.2 uh, million. The reductions or, or the balance of, of this $3.2 million was achieved through a number of different things. First of all, um, we were fortunate to have tuition revenue increase um, based on enrollment numbers. So we did not, of course, have tuition increases, but our enrollment continues to climb, and so the uh, escalation in enrollment uh, increased our, our revenue on, on that front. Secondly, we did eliminate 19 positions, uh, both academic and non-academic. Uh, the majority of these positions uh, were positions that were not filled, and so we, uh, we made the decision that this was um, a, a direction to undertake rather than look towards uh, a significant number of layoffs. Thirdly, uh, we, introdu we, uh, we deleted uh, our uh, salary contingency. And so universities, all organizations, build in contingencies uh, to manage any of the ups and downs that you might face in the economy or as a result of just challenges that emerge for the university. We no longer have a salary contingency. That was part of what we uh, got rid of. We also, uh, also reduced our general contingency by a half a million dollars. So we had both a general contingency as well as a salary contingency. Now our, our overall contingency has to also accommodate our uh, salary contingency. We reduced life cycle funding, and so life cycle funding is to support everything that uh, needs to be changed out on an ongoing basis. That could be everything from computers to various uh, forms of infrastructure. And so again, a uh, difficult decision, but one that had to be made. And lastly, we looked to ancillary services to increase the amount of revenue, revenue that they uh, provide to the general operating fund of the budget. On an annual basis, ancillary services, that's the Things like food services, the bookstore, printing services, etc., cetera, um, generates revenue. A lot of that revenue has to go back into operation. A portion of it uh, comes into the operating of the, of the university. So we asked ancillary services basically to provide more funding to the general operating budget, uh, therefore reducing the amount of money they had to actually operate. So those are the areas that we uh, um, focused on as we move through getting to that endpoint of the uh, budget reduction for 2019-2020.
I'll just underscore that um, I, I want to emphasize that for the remainder of 2019, there will be no layoffs. We have uh, uh, made our, the budget for this fiscal year, uh, but I'll come, I'll, I'll come back to talking about the years going forward. And I, I should stop here. I should have said right at the outset that, uh, of course, we'll have lots of time for questions at the end. Uh, so I'm going to move through this, not asking for questions at the end of each slide. But I want to assure you that there'll be lots of opportunity for questions. This next slide really starts to then look into the future and what, what does the future hold as it relates to uh, the University of Lethbridge and our budget. And so this very uh, cool graphic that Nancy and her team have uh, developed, um, and I, I think it's fairly obvious what, what, uh, what the graphic represents, but basically, um, as you can see, um, we project in the 2020-2021 uh, a Campus Alberta further decrease by 3.35 million. Now, that is a projection. That's not based on um, concrete information because we don't have that concrete Im information. So what we've done for this point in time is we've projected uh, a, a decrease based on the same decrease we received uh, this year. How we've come up with that is um, we know now from the government that they intend to reduce uh, the overall budgets of ins or the overall op base budgets from each of the institutions on average by 5%. So year one was on average 5%, but I think you know that the upper end was 7.9% and the lower end was zero. Uh, the intent going forward is three more years of on average 5% reductions to our base operating grant. So for this year, what we've done is we've, uh, this year coming up, we projected the same number as this, this year that we've just, uh, uh, well, the year we're in, 2019, 2020. That is an estimate, uh, that could change, but we need a number to work with, and so that's the number we're starting to work with. Um, we contrast that just to show you how these two pieces fit together, that if we were to increase our tuition by 7% in this same year, 2020, 2021, we would um, increase revenue uh, to the bottom line by $2.6 million. So that gives you a sense of the, the relationship between uh, the increase in tuition that we could maximally employ, domestic tuition I'll emphasize, versus what the um, impact of a 3.4%, a 3.2% reduction would be. Just to give you a sense of, uh, of how we're working through these, uh, the budget exercises. So in terms of then, how do we deal with, so what are our strategies uh, for both dealing with uh, this upcoming year? Uh, it, you know, whatever the number finally is, uh, some variation of an average of 5%. Um, these are the initial strategies that we're working with. Number one is to increase tuition fee revenue, fees and enrollment. And so, um, the, uh, of course, the aspirations of the university are to continue to increase enrollment. Each time we increase enrollment, we have increased revenue. We will also be looking at an increase in, uh, in the actual tuition uh, amount, and that, that uh, consideration will be undertaken over the next few months. Secondly is international student enrollment increases. Presently, our international student enrollment is about 6.5%. Uh, we have a vision to move towards 10% and potentially beyond. Uh, international student revenue is about three, roughly three times uh, the, the revenue of domestic tuition. And so this is both uh, a revenue source for us, of course, but also uh, contributes to the ongoing uh, diversification of the university community, uh, which is an important aspiration. And I, I would underscore this, that um, well before these budget uh, cuts were introduced, we had a strategic uh, plan for internationalization that had a number of 10% and potentially beyond. So the, the, the number in that strategic plan has not changed since uh, we uh, were uh, introduced to this uh, budget challenge, but it may mean that we do look beyond 10% and that, that will be part of the deliberations. Uh, thirdly, we will only replace essential employment positions. And what does that mean? I'm sure we'll be asked that question later. Of course, that's an ongoing um, series of deliberations as to what is necessary, both within academic programming, within administration, and, and uh, within services. And so um, 
with a, a budget reduction uh, necessary as, as articulated, uh, looking at um, uh, positions will be a necessity. Fourthly is all operations and expenditures will be reviewed. That, of course, has already been ongoing. We've been looking at operations and expenditures for, uh, for years, not just months. Uh, that uh, exercise will continue with a vengeance. Uh, and the next is revenue opportunities. So beyond tuition, and I think it's very important to underscore that we have to look beyond tuition. We are and will be looking at what are the other revenue sources that we can um, uh, look to to support the university in the years to come. We have initial uh, discussions about what we might do with our South Campus lands from a revenue generation perspective. We're looking at what revenue opportunities there are in Calgary, out of our Calgary campus that would be about professional development that would bring in revenue. So we have uh, lots of conversations uh, taking place right now around how do we also change the, uh, the revenue numbers. And lastly, strategic workforce planning is a very important part of any or organization's exercise, which is not only looking at position by position, but also looking more broadly at what is our strategic workforce plan, what does that look like in the years to come, and that'll be an important part of the exercise. So now I guess the, the key question is what does the future hold? I've, I've uh, talked a little bit about this already, but I'll just uh, um, finish off with a, a few key comments. Uh, we do know that there will be further uh, government grant reductions. I've, I've told you that we know that on average they will be 5% over the next uh, three years. And so that, um, the, the actual number though is something that is still a work in progress. We now know that the government plans to introduce a new budget model. And so the budget model that we presently have is a historic model, meaning last year we received X number of dollars, a uh, little over 102 million, well, it used to be $104 million, now 102-ish million dollars. And so any increase uh, was based on that baseline, any decrease is based on that same baseline. Looking forward, the government intends to introduce a different model, which will be a model that is based on a number of, of metrics. Uh, we do not yet know what the exact metrics are, but we uh, would anticipate that they will range from enrollment to retention to uh, completion rates to employment rates, etc. cetera. Uh, this work has already been undertaken in Ontario, if any of you have been watching this. We expect that there will be lots bored from what the work that's gone on in Ontario. We also know that there will be some level of at-risk grant funding. Now, um, for those that aren't familiar with the notion of at-risk funding, um, at-risk funding means that in a total of 100% of your funding, there will be some percentage that will be based on metrics that will then determine the, the amount of that at-risk funding that you receive. We don't know what percentage of our overall base funding this at-risk funding will be. Um, it could be any percentage. It could be 5%, it could be 30%. And so part of what we're doing, I'll, I'll just assure you, is lobbying the government to have uh, that portion of our grant be as minimal as possible because at-risk funding, of course, is a risky business. And so um, this, is, this is a message that all of us are providing across the province of Alberta. Uh, we do also know that there, um, at, at least at this point in time, there is a projected uh, in, uh, tuition increase, fee increase of up to 7% per year over three years, so up to 21% over the next three years. And we also um, have other questions that are yet unanswered. So, we think we will receive infrastructure maintenance funding. This has been implied by the government for next year. But of course, until we see it, I, I, we can't be assured that we'll receive those funds. We don't know about lights on funding for the, for the science commons. And so presently, um, the operating of that building is with our, our um, existing uh, revenue. And, and uh, looking forward, the big question is, will the government give us any recognition of the cost of running that new building uh, or not. And so that's a, that's a question that uh, is still to be answered. So I'll um, finish off and then open it up for questions um, by just emphasizing that we will continue to uh, communicate with uh, all of you uh, on an ongoing basis as we look forward. 
After the uh, Christmas holiday, one of the things that we are intending on doing is having smaller meetings with uh, folks on campus. So rather than big town halls where lots of people will not be as comfortable uh, either um, being involved in the conversation or asking questions, our intent is to have small, smaller group meetings around campus so that we can communicate with folks but also enable people to, um, to ask questions. Those uh, will also be opportunities to have um, people provide any kind of ideas you may have as to how you think the university should be uh, both looking at revenue enhancement as well as uh, strategies around reducing our overall uh, expenditures. And so uh, look, f look for those opportunities in the new year. Uh, we will move them around campus. We'll have them at different times of day. And we do intend to ensure that the groupings are such that, that um, folks will be comfortable speaking uh, amongst uh, colleagues. So we'll look forward to continuing to consult with you, communicate with you as we move forward. At this point in time, I think that's enough information. Um, and now what we'll do is we're going to just open it up for questions and comments. And uh, I'd like to thank uh, Nancy and Andy for uh, being up here with me. And uh, they get all the difficult ones. So we'll uh, uh, now I think we do have mics. Uh, there's one here and one here. Uh, and so it is kind of a big room. So if you have a question, if you don't mind coming down to the mic, that would be helpful. So thank you. I have three, I think, very short questions. One is that the English department is now interviewing for a position. We're very shorthanded. Um, is that going to be one of the positions that's going to be cut? Any position, Maureen, that has been approved is in process, will carry on. Okay, thank you. Um, the second one is, you may not know this, the answer is probably up to the government, but the whole performance-based issue um, is usually taken in terms of immediate employability. But there was a recent New York Times article that showed that humanities majors, in fact, earn at by age 40, earn as much or more than STEM majors. Is there any way that we can encourage performance to be looked at over a long period rather than just in the year after graduation? Um, some time ago, um, we created a document on behalf of the system, and I was the author of that, that put forward a model for how to look at funding in the system. Whether or not that's going to be used or not, we don't know. But one of the key points to answer your question is that any variation in funding looks at rolling averages over periods of years. It is not a year-by-year -year oscillation, which would bring roller coaster behavior in any sort of funding model. So we may still have an opportunity to influence the parameters around performance. But to, to echo what Mike has said so far, Maureen, we simply do not know at this point what our input to that will be or can be. Okay, and my third, thank you. That's kind of what I expected. Uh, my third question is, um, we built the science commons to provide better facilities for the sciences. Um, but my understanding is that arts and science doesn't have the money to um, do anything with the old science labs in U-Haul, where we don't have enough seminar rooms, we don't have enough flexible classrooms, but apparently those are gonna stay and be dead space. Do we have any hope of being able to renovate them? Sure, I'll answer that one. Uh, one of the, um, we certainly, that's what we had in plan, and one of the, some of the funding sources that we were gonna use for that was the infrastructure maintenance program, the 4.2 that was cut out this year. Now they have said when they told us that they were gonna cut out the 4.2 that we were going to, they were going to reinstate it next year. Now we do have some money that was saved up from previous infrastructure maintenance programs. So we are going to try and do at least the bare minimum, um, get rid of, um, you know, close off the fume hoods, um, clean out the stacks, maybe do some painting so that we can get people into those rooms. So that's what we're, we're looking at now. What's the bare minimum so that we can at least, it won't be fancy, it won't be great, but can we use the space? And so that's what we're looking at now. So we're hoping that we can have um, some, some improvements there. Thank Just you. to add, Maureen, 
the other part of that is we have never stopped the conversation with government to try and move this forward as a priority for the institution. It was always the intention to have destination phase one and two. And so Mike, for example, in his last few meetings with government has always pushed this agenda. This was a multiple, multiple year commitment and we were looking for that. Thank you. Uh, my r question relates to tuition. Uh, where does University of Lethbridge stand in terms of competitiveness when it comes to, or even Alberta, when it comes to tuition fees? Uh, can you explain about that a little bit, please? Sure. Um, we, uh, the U of L has the lowest um, tuition of the comprehensive research institutions, um, and in fact, we're actually just a teeny bit lower than um, even Mount Royal University, which is a new um, university within the province. So. Um, Everyone's tired of hearing me say this, but we've been writing for about 17 or 18 years saying that this disparity um, needs to be corrected. And it was, um, it was back, I won't go into the details, but it was a result of, of a previous um, tuition regulations on how it worked and how it impacted the University of Lethbridge. So we've been continuing um, to talk about that. Um, that uh, we have the lowest and uh, yet we think that we have um, as good a programs, if not better, than the un other institutions. So we need to charge similar tuition rates as um, other institutions. Keeping that in mind that we do not want to gouge our students. This is not that this is the students are going to solve all our problems. We want to make sure that they're paying a competitive rate, that we have a competitive rate in, in terms of how we can operate our funds. And um, so, and we also have to think about access. One of our budget values is that we believe everyone should have access to education. How we do that, whether it's um, through tuition, lower tuition, or scholarships, or bursaries, or needs-based, uh, we need to consider all of those things when we set our tuition rates. The only other thing I'll add on tuition is, uh, of course, well, I shouldn't say of course, I, I wanna emphasize that we will uh, consult with our students as we move through the decision-making process. We already have had some initial discussions uh, with both the undergraduate and graduate students and those uh, consultations uh, will continue. Uh, we have great respect for our student bodies and for ensuring that they are part of our um, uh, consideration and also, um, as, as you know, they are part of our governance bodies, both General Faculties Council and the board. So students will be involved in the deliberations uh, as uh, we move through, uh, obviously, the difficult discussions about what to do on the tuition front. Hi, I'd like to actually just follow up on that one point to clarify the discussions that you've had, whether you've act actively reached out to the First Nations students, because as it stands, they're already um, astonishingly, astonishingly um, disadvantaged with tuition models. That's going to increase with the reductions in scholarships, and especially considering the caps on their tuition funding is based on the 1996 funding model. So I guess in that, whether you have or have not, I'd like to suggest that you specifically target them in that. Thank you, and I will say that we haven't had specific uh, uh, deliberations or, or consultation with uh, our Indigenous students, but it's a, it's a very good uh, uh, point and suggestion. I would also say that we are working hard, actually, on some different um, pieces around support for our Indigenous students, and um, in fact, um, Within about a month, we'll have a fairly major announcement about new uh, supports for our Indigenous uh, community, both here on campus and on ca off campus, of great significance. And I guess I would, I would um, use that as a bit of a, a point in time to, to emphasize that as we move through these difficult uh, times, uh, there will be opportunities for us to bring new resources into the institution and, and I, as I, I mentioned, we will have a very exciting announcement about supports for, for our Indigenous community here on campus and off. And so the challenge will always be, as we're going through those very difficult uh, budget deliberations, uh, seeing new resources to come onto campus to support either new things or to support new uh, existing initiatives. And so I know this will be a, a challenging piece for all of us to, to look at 
budget reductions and while at the same time we look at new resources coming onto campus from external sources and so I just point that out as one of the the, the dilemmas that all institutions face uh, that move through this that uh, it's important for us to look for new resources if we don't look for new resources we will be very challenged as an institution so finding that balance between res reductions but also looking for new resources will be an important part of the endeavor um, I'm just wondering, <clears throat> last year we had a $7.9 million surplus. Um, you reported that in March of this year. Is that money, any of that going to be able to be used to help us? How do you plan to use that type of money to support us? I just thought maybe you would have mentioned something about that. Thank sure. you. Um, I'd like to respond to that. So, um, for those of you, the the Campus Alberta grant was reduced based on the, on the province's calculation of our surplus. And it was a surplus over five years. Um, and so they said that our annual surplus amount was $7.2 million. So I was, I was struggling trying to get that number um, based on a, our audited financial statements. And so what we discovered is that they actually included our endowment funds in that, so any endowment revenue. Those are basically donations that we get from external um, agencies, entities, uh, donors that, uh, for example, for scholarships. You can't spend endowment money. Once it comes in, you have to keep it into perpetuity. On that same budget report, I thought I saw somewhere that it said only 0.6% or something was Sorry? being used for, from endowment funds. I, d I didn't think it was that much. Yes, it is. So we have the so report. the calculation that they calculated was 7.2. <coughs> if we take out the endowments, our surplus would be on average 4.2. But also in those five years, we had an extraordinary um, investment income uh, realized that we realized um, because we switched investment managers, we didn't realize is, is incomes, we switched investments managers, the way the accounting works is that you have to recognize that. But we reinvested that, so that was $12.5 million. So if you take out the endowment money, and you take out the 12.5 million, our annual surplus, average surplus is 1.7 million. So no, we don't really have surplus money that we can put into balancing our budget. But I, I, I would say of, of the, the surplus money that we do have available. Of course, we're looking at how we can use those, uh, those dollars to help uh, balance the budget, and that is in part uh, what we've done here. Uh, the challenge is uh, one-time do dollars of 1.5 or 1.7 million are not dollars that we can predict on an annual basis. So it's not money that we could hire a professor with, that we could hire uh, continuing staff with. So, so that's the balancing act of using uh, um, even the, the small surplus that we do have. Um, and then I was just also wondering, um, with some of what you mentioned here, it looks like we'll have to increase enrollment further. Um, how do you anticipate the ed program to be affected by that? It doesn't look good for prospects for educators in the province, so. I can perhaps try and answer that one for you. It's, um, it's a really challenging environment out there at the moment. If you look at the K-12 system and where it's going, and it's very difficult to see what the overall direction of the system is at the moment. It's complicated by the fact that other institutions in the province that are looking to get that university status are already planning education degree programs. That's a pretty poor step in my opinion, but that's only my opinion. I don't opinion. think they will be. Yeah, it's, uh, it's quite incredible given what's happening at the moment. Having said that, I would stand by the fact that we have the platinum card program in the province. I agree, which is why I think we should advocate for educators more than we other universities. We will be, and we will not be looking to reduce the number of students moving through that program. Our students are always the first ones that are moving off the lists into the system. How the system will respond will dictate exactly how we'll, we'll go forward. But at this time, I have confidence to say we'll maintain our numbers. The only other thing I'd add is that we do know there's a large bubble of, of um, folks in uh, K-12 that are of retirement age and so when you look predictively at the numbers once that bubble actually starts to move uh, the need for teachers will be significant and so uh, one of the challenges in this whole workforce planning uh, exercise is that um, you make predictions based on how you think behavior will um, uh, under uh, be undertaken in the case of, of this bubble they have stayed in their positions longer than was predicted. So we do know that that bubble will eventually move out. 
Thanks for your questions. Hi, thank you for the update of the budget. Uh, I think with regards to the presentation, we at the university would be depending so much on uh, student uh, tuition fee, particularly international students. So we will be, international students would be representing the cash cow of the university. At what, how much are you going to increase for that uh, tuition fee for you know, international students? And what would be the comparable service if we actually increase that, that amount of money of, of coming from international students and what we could offer here at the University of Lethbridge? Thanks for your question. It's a very good one. I mean, I, I reel a little bit at the cash cow statement because that's not the intention. We went well before any budget pieces in the province. We had looked to see where our international enrollment stood. And for an institution of our size and overall student population, on average, you will see institutions with about 11% international students. That's across the country. Last week when Mike and I were in Calgary talking to some experts in internationalization as we thought about how we'd plan our future, they indicated that that's moving towards 15% for institutions of our side. But nevertheless, we had taken that information before and really looked towards a growth plan that'll take us towards 10% in the next few years. And last year we had a good increase in international student numbers and I would predict from the applications we've had already that we'll see another increase this year uh, in the next four. Now, if I look to think about what we have to do under the current tuition regulations, which is to guarantee international students four years, we have to tell them how much it's gonna cost them over four years, we are not planning anything with international student tuition increases at this time because those regulations are in place. Nancy, would, anything else? On that yeah, point? this is going to have to be looked at very, very carefully. And, and again, uh, you know, access is important to us, but the whole program, the whole idea of having, um, you know, ingoing and um, or incoming and outgoing um, students to international areas is very, very important. But we have to look at this. This is, we still haven't actually got the tuition regulations. We haven't got the writing. This has all been verbal. So we need to have a good look at what they um, actually say in, in language so we can figure it out. One other point, Brent, uh, Glenda, is that if we're gonna commit to this increase in national students, and I think the market is there for us to do that, um, we need to ensure that we have the right support services. Without the right support services and funding those support services, we're doing ourselves a massive disservice. And so that is part of our planning. What will it take to support that increase in the international student body as we go forward? What are the services that we need to maintain and actually build upon to ensure that everything is handled appropriately? What we don't want is to co cause a crisis on existing services within the institution. Great question, thank you very much. We'll go to this side next. Uh, I'm curious if the 2.6 million projection from increased tuition takes into account the possibility that enrollment will actually de decline due to the increased financial burden it will place on students. No, the, uh, the enrollment, this 2.26 uh, is based on our prediction, very conservative predictions on enrollment. And I, I would just say um, to that, you know, to your question, that of course, um, finding that balance in terms of uh, tuition increases and not affecting enrollment is something we're thinking a lot about. Um, and so that is par part of the consideration as, as we look at it today, but also as we look forward. But at the same time, I would say this has always been our challenge as an institution in Southern Alberta that has 70-ish uh, percent of our students that come from outside of this uh, city. We've had always had to be very uh, mindful of what uh, we charge tuition-wise, what services we provide, et cetera, et cetera. And so this same ethos of considering the implications of various decisions will be a big part of how we look forward. I just add that no decision about where we're going to go with tuition is going to be done in the isolation of just looking at the U of L. We're going to look at the market very, very carefully. We must keep an eye on what the U of A, U of C are doing, what Mount, Mount Royal, what Grant McEwen are doing. We're not gonna do this in isolation. And as we move forward, we'll have to take key strategic actions based on what the enrollment trajectories look like. And th the last uh, piece on this, I think, is you know, the triangle that uh, talked about people, quality, and access is, is a triangle uh, for a reason, to show the interconnectedness of those uh, concepts. And so there's obviously a real 
important in interconnection between quality and access. And so we recognize that access is an important aspiration for the institution, but we also recognize that our students come to the University of Lethbridge with an expectation of quality. So if we were, for example, to make the decision that we would have a much uh, lower tuition than other institutions in the province of Alberta, the challenge with that decision is that we would then start jeopardizing the quality of the student experience, and we could see an even greater decline in enrollment because of that. So, so the balancing between quality and access is a very important part of the equation. Uh, I have another question on uh, the positions, if that's all right. Uh, how do you intend to minimize the workload impact to staff when you begin to consolidate positions and only replace the essential positions? So for example, with the combining of the AVPR with the Dean of uh, SGS, uh, conceivably this person is going to be doing the work of two people but receiving the salary of one. And how do you intend to kind of minimize the impact of that workload on them? That's a great question. and. You know, to be honest with you, you, you have to look at that overall work piece and ask the very salient question, what goes? It's not sustainable to say to someone, well, you're doing the job of two people now. It's not. So we are trying to make very strategic sort of decisions about what stays, what goes in terms of the duties and assignments that people are given. And to be honest, in this new environment, we can't do everything. That is an outcome of where the government is taking us with these funding cuts. We can't keep on doing everything we were doing at the same level. Something has to give. It's that triangle. You can't maintain that perfectly every single time. Something has to give. And in this particular case, it'll be something that we're doing uh, in terms of the services we perhaps provide will be shrank. And I, I guess I will point to uh, what I think is a really important document, which is our people plan. And the people plan was developed really at um, as a result of lots of discussion with uh, faculty and staff uh, about their belief that it was really important for us to have a plan that um, addressed the, the, uh, the needs and aspirations of faculty and staff. And so when, when we look at how we're going to address uh, the, the question that you asked, I think part of it is to look back to our community to have conversations about what can we do? What are the things that we can uh, do less of? What are the things we can do differently? How can we m be more effective at delivering services in different ways? And that will be a very important part of the exercise, to be honest, because as Andy said, we can't just keep doing everything we're doing if we have 20% less of our base budget uh, as an institution. We are gonna have to make some difficult decisions about what we offer, what we provide, how we do it. Part of what Mike said before was that in all of this, in this milieu of reductions, you have to keep extremely focused on what your priorities are. There are nice to haves, interesting to haves, but now we're into the must do's. And prioritization is one of the key things that we've worried about as we've moved forward through these last few months when we heard what the reduction is gonna be. What are the real priorities to move this institution forward? Because we will not go backwards. We need to keep moving. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. Um, this is probably, uh, it's not really a difficult question, but, um, well, number one, I, I, want, I do want to thank the um, staff and, and people have been working on this because I know it is a kind of a crisis and it's been really accelerated crisis and I appreciate that work. Um, and I think most of us in the university do really appreciate all tiers of the workforce and that's one thing that I feel is quite unique about our university. Um, I guess my question is about uh, kind of spanning out into the community and I know Mike you do a lot of that work and I wondered if there was any um, benefits or profits from meeting with say chief and council at Kainai and chief and council at Bigani and uh, I'm sure you've already met with people at the city or, or business owners or agricultural uh, you know, uh, is there to, to really reveal what the university is facing because it's so cr critical to all of those growing populations and really provides um, the roots. And I think it's respected when we reach out in that way. So, that's my yeah, uh, and great question. Is they they've all been? Um, of course, the university is so uh, deeply rooted in in this city, but in southern Alberta and, and beyond. 
and we recognize that we wouldn't exist if it weren't for the community. So we have been reaching out uh, in various ways to different uh, individuals and groups. Uh, we're trying to help um, individual or, or individuals and groups understand the impact of the reductions on the university. Uh, we've been, of course, communicating about the impact of the university on the community, even from an economic standpoint, about $800 million a year, uh, over a billion dollars in the province of, of Alberta. And so helping folks understand that this is just not a, um, an issue for the university. It's an issue for the city. We're the, other than health, uh, we're the largest employer in the city. And so we, uh, we have a very impactful footprint. And so reducing um, expenditures by the university is, of course, something that everybody should be worried about. Now, finding the, the balance point in that, um, um, along with our other community partners that are also having the same kinds of challenges, is something that I'm very mindful of, to be honest. So I'm, I've been very careful not to kind of uh, suggest that the university is uh, more important than uh, our two school divisions, for example, that are having very significant challenges. And we just saw, for example, the deci decision around busing that was just taken by the city and the impact that will have on, on, on uh, the K-12 sector. So I, from my perspective, it's both helping people understand what's going on from a university perspective, but also helping people understand the impact of this on, on the different uh, organizations and institutions in Lethbridge and surrounding area. And so part of what I think we're trying to do is to also have conversations about how do we work together uh, to try and um, both influence government about the, um, the value proposition of our city, our, the institutions in this city, and thinking about or, or having them remind themselves about the fact that when you make reductions in these various organizations, uh, the impact on the, the community overall is significant. And, and so that's, that's a big part of the conversations we're having, but it's a, it's a great reminder, Carol, that um, it, it's, it's really important work. I had a really interesting conversation with one of our, our um, institutional leaders uh, last night on the phone uh, who, you know, was phoning to commiserate or, or really just talk about how we were working through these things. And one of the things I was really struck by when he and I were chatting as we talked about our approaches was the importance of us not developing a bunker mentality where we kind of um, put our heads down and hold on for dear life, but the, we recognize that the solution is really in continuing to try and deliver all that we deliver on this campus in a really strong way so that we can t continue to be a strong institution so that students do want to come to the University of Lethbridge so that the, w the faculty that we're recruiting that f uh, faculty member for the English department that we're hopefully going to recruit sees Lethbridge and the university as a great place to come. And so I'll just, um, I'll, I'll, I'll put a plug in for us being, um, being a community that both recognizes the challenges we face but also recognizing that every one of us is part of the solution, which is to ensure that we don't um, sink to the com uh, lowest common denominator in terms of conversation, because it's not going to be helpful. I, you know, if you spend time in Calgary these days, uh, any time in Calgary, you'll see a community that has, is really struggling far more than, than we are here in Lethbridge. And the thing I'm struck by when I'm in Calgary is how dark many of the conversations are that I have with folks in Calgary. And of course, we're going to have some real significant challenges here on campus and in the city. But recognizing that um, part of the solution is in us looking for solutions is going to be an important part of the exercise. Uh, if I could add to that too, I think it's very, very important. We don't want to sound defensive when we're out there in the in the community. As Mike said, we have to we have to think forward and how we're going to move ahead and and still have a strong institution. But I think it's also very, very important that we get the news out about about the facts. Um, the question was about the 7.2 um, million dollar surplus. Well, trying to explain that the other the other. Um, number that keeps showing up in the government conversations is that um, post-secondaries in Alberta spend $10,000 per student more than they do in BC or the Ontario or in Quebec. Those were the, the, the numbers that came out of the, the uh, McKenna report. So to put it in perspective, they included 
just expenses and they included just, or, or there are consolidated numbers. I can reduce that um, $10,000 um, per student if we just eliminated all of research. That reduces our expenses at the institution and we will have, we will spend less um, per student on that. That is absolutely the wrong thing to do or even to think about it. But we need to get that out there in the public and trying to explain, and I know this is the accountant in me talking and so my, some of my colleagues just roll their eyes, but we need to get it out there that here are the facts and here's how they calculated it and here's what it means to our institution. Any other questions? Don't want to keep you here longer than uh uh, you want to stay, and I know it's uh, going to be a blustery night out there, but I want to make sure that uh, if there are questions, uh, I think I, I see one more at least, maybe two. Perfect. Go Just ahead. to be clear, because I'm going to have students who are asking about this, am I correct in understanding you, you have not yet settled on what the tuition increase may be for starting in, would it start in summer one of 2020? It would start in fall of 2020. Fall of 2020. Yes. And you, do you, can you state the amount yet? Or you, no, you we can't. Uh, for one thing, number one, uh, there is a process of consultation with our students. We've started that. But ultimately, this is also a, a, a pretty thorough discussion on campus as we uh, move through. But in the end, it's a board decision. And so uh, it would be tremendously premature of me to say what I expect the board will approve. Sure. It, the, the approval of tuition likely Nancy will be in well uh, we were we were told that uh, just this morning actually that we should get the tuition regulations before Christmas so we're hoping once we get the regulations and find out what they actually say we'll have consultations in January okay and, and, I, I, and but on that I, I just want to emphasize we will provide that information as soon as we can we're not going to to sort of hide uh, the information once it's uh, decided uh, one, one thing that had been said fairly recently was that 7% increase allowed, but no more than 10% per program? What, what does that mean? Yeah. I'll let Andy. There's um, an overall matrix of all the programs that we have. And so the maximum increase is 10%, but the aggregate across all programs should be 7% for the institution. By, by program, you mean something like a BSC versus a, a, yeah, a exactly. BFA or something? Like exactly. That. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But you, so it's conceivable, therefore, that one the BSC in one area could conceivably be have a different rate That's than conceivable. something else. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'll ask two questions, if if I can. I think the first one's quite quick. Can you tell us about the timeline for the 2020-2021 budget, and when we can expect more information sure. on that? Thank you. Um, we um, have been told that the. Uh, uh, budget will be in February. Now that's um, what we're told at this point in time, but there has been fairly consistent information from the government that the budget will come out in February, which means that we would then have to move very quickly to um, uh, uh, develop our budget that would then move to the board. Um, and so if we got it in, in February, I would anticipate we would probably approve our budget in April. We, we don't have a March board meeting. Yeah, so uh, my, that's my best uh, information at, that, at this point in time. We have had years where the budget has taken longer than that, but the government seems fairly intent on having uh, their budget uh, uh, announced in, in February of 2020. Thank you. My second question is related to the people plan that was mentioned. It currently runs to 2019, um, and so I'm wondering what plans, if any, are in place to review the effectiveness of the plan that's just coming to an end, as well as prepare a new plan that might guide us through some of the challenges we're facing. Sorry, I didn't hear everything on the question. Could you repeat it? Sorry. Sorry, yes. The current people plan runs to the end of 2019, um, and so I'm wondering what plans, if any, are in place to review the plan that's coming to an end and prepare another one to see us through the challenges that we are facing. Yeah, Mike um, um, had in one of the slides said that we, we do have a balanced budget. Um, again, we've uh, the, the 19 positions that were either vacant or um, terminations or and we have reduced our salary contingencies and our life cycle and as well as the contributions for ancillary services. So we have 1920 
balance. So there again, um, we have that worked out. We are already started. We have been planning for the 2021 um, of all the issues that um, that Mike outlined. I'm not answering. Yeah, the question. You're not answering anymore. the question, my friend. No, I, that's all right. So <laughs> let us help you with that. Yeah. One. So so the people plan, uh, yes, uh, does complete in 2019. Uh, the intent is to to uh, develop a new people plan. So the, this which is um, process wise uh, led by Ariane Tenen, our AVP. Um, uh, HR and so um, so there's both the people plan that will be developed. We also have a have um, a schedule, I guess I would call it, uh, to do um, a uh, survey every second year, uh, employee satisfaction survey, etc. And so that work will also continue. And so between the employee satisfaction survey as well as uh, the consultation process that will unfold for uh, the new people plan, uh, I'm very um, confident that you know the the considerations that need to be undertaken around how do we create an environment which is still uh, conducive to uh, a healthy workforce will be a big part of those discussions yeah just to add to that we um, <laughs> as if the, the timing is not great but we'll also be looking at the academic and the research plan because it's our understanding that the reporting tool to government is going to change dramatically so over the last number of years, we've worked with something called the Comprehensive Institutional Plan, which has basically been a rollout of all our activities to the government, including budget, uh, including sort of our future plans. We have no details, and that has been a constant theme of this presentation. We have no details, but we understand that the document for reporting at the institution is going to change. So it is a time when we'll be looking at all of those key direction documents to see that we've got alignment and moving them forward. All right, any other questions? Is this a question coming down? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> we will wait. That was smooth. I like that. Okay. So you mentioned an increase in support services for uh, both international students with that increase, along with professionals who are taking over more than one of their positions. What does that look like? Does that look like an increase in the counseling budget or academic advising for those international students? It could be a mixture of all those things. Now, I'm very pleased to say that this year we maintained our mental health funding for all students. Um, we will have to see where the resources are needed and prioritize accordingly. It will obviously depend on how much new revenue comes in as well as we move forward. But the commitment is to try and maintain and build where we need to on the services that are there. I don't have an exact plan I can roll out and tell you but we're going to put positions here and there. We're not at that point yet, because simply put, I don't know what the reductions are going to be in the overall grant to the institution until, at the earliest, February. Of course. Okay. Thanks. Pleasure. Thank you. Any other questions? Well, I'll just then uh, close off um, by first of all saying thank you to Nancy and Andy for uh, participating here today. Thanks to those that uh, helped make sure that we uh, could uh, host this meeting here, putting the IT together and uh, making sure the lights were on and people were home. Uh, thank you, um, everybody, for coming today. We uh, really wanted to ensure that we had an opportunity to have a town hall uh, that enabled us to provide you as much information as we could, but also to allow folks that had questions to ask questions. I would say that, that uh, as we move forward, we encourage you to continue to communicate with us. Use as many different vehicles as uh, makes sense for you, whether it's talking to uh, folks that you work with that uh, then can communicate to those that uh, can get information to us. We will in the new year, as I said, as we start to build uh, towards the, the next budget, we'll have opportunities for uh, communication. And I, I just do want to finish off by underscoring that I do recognize the challenges that we face and that these are, are not easy times for any of us to uh, move through. But I, I do also um, have the, uh, I guess, the benefit of having been at this business for more than a couple of years, uh, having lived through my a strike in uh, 1992 when I was a brand new faculty member at the University of Manitoba and budget cuts in, in Manitoba uh, in the 90s like the budget cuts here in, in uh, Alberta in the 90s. And as I look back over my 30 years of uh, being at this activity, um, I, I can assure you 
that we will have difficult times, but we will get past those difficult times, and the institution will continue to prosper. We will um, see changes in our workforce, but we'll also see some positive changes in our workforce. We'll see new people come onto campus. We'll see new initiatives on campus. So I end off with that because I think it's important to end on a note that optimism is never a bad thing and I'm a glass half full guy, so I will continue to be optimistic that the future is a future that we're gonna to continue to prosper in as a university. So with that, thank you all for being here today, and uh, I hope you all have a safe drive home. It looked like the snow was ending, so we'll hope the snow has ended. Thanks, folks.